Chapter 11 Herman entered the dark house, trying to make as little noise as possible. There's a light down upstairs, said Barrow, just behind him. It's her father's bedroom, said Herman, mounting the stairs quietly. He slowly turned the handle of the bedroom door and gently pushed it open. Herman's worst fears were realized. Barrow pushed past him and leaned towards the man on the bed. What's happened, sir? Where are you hurt? Simmons' eyes looked down as though indicating at something near his stomach. Barrow yanked back the bedclothes and both men gasped. The end of a pair of scissors protruded from Simmons' stomach and the sheets were stained with blood. Jesus, breathed Barrow. He turned towards Herman. I'm going to ride over an ambulance. Don't touch the scissors. Don't try and pull them out. He disappeared through the door. Homan bent his head towards Casey's father as he tried to speak. Why did she do it? I loved her. She knew that. She wasn't responsible, Homan told him. She came in contact with the poisonous gas that affected her mind. Simmons' brain accepted the words almost with relief. She tried to kill him because she was ill. It hadn't been an act of hate. I had brought her home, he said. She kept putting her hands to her head as though she, she were in pain. They, they didn't want to let her go, but uh, I knew she'd be better off with me. He was deep in his own thoughts. After we'd gone to bed, I, w I woke up perhaps a couple of hours later, and uh, there she was, standing over me. I, I put out my arms, and, and she came towards me. He began to tremble uncontrollably. Then she pulled back the bedclothes, and I, I saw the scissors slashing down. His voice broke as he relived the experience. A cry from downstairs interrupted them. It had sounded like a man's cry, probably Barrow's. Homan left the dying man, flew down the stairs and pushed open the study door. Then he stopped. Barrow was on his hands and knees on the floor, blood oozing from a wound in his scalp. Casey stood above him, a wicked-looking shard of glass in her hand. She raised her arm, ready to plunge the pointed glass down into the back of Barrow's neck. Homan ducked under her arm and slammed his elbow into her, knocking her against the wall. He knew from their previous struggle he would have to use force. He pinned her arms behind her, using all his strength. Barrow was watching them in amazement. Christ, he gasped. I to think that I didn't believe you. Homan shouted at him, get something to tie her up with. The policeman disappeared and returned a moment later with a length of curtain rope. The driver of the police car came through the front door as they were tying the girl's hands. Ambulance is on his way, sir, he said to Barrow, not raising an eyebrow at the scene before him. Homan led the girl into the vast lounge where he sat her down on a long leather settee. He knelt before her, taking her pale face in his hands. She stared past him, over his shoulder, her eyes wide and unseeing. Casey, darling, can you hear me? He asked tenderly. Her eyes looked back at him coldly. Bastard, she said. Doesn't know you, Holman. Can't you say that? said Barrow, not unkindly. No, she doesn't. Holman's eyes clouded. Will she ever know me again? This time, Holman went with Casey to the hospital, and Detective Inspector Barrow went back to Chief Superintendent Reeford at New Scotland Yard. He hurried to Reeford's office, who sent him rushing back to the hospital to bring him home. And when they got back, Reeford wasted no time. We've little time to apologize, Mr. Homan, he began bluntly. I've heard briefly what happened to yourself and Detective Inspector Barrow, and I sympathize, but events have taken on a greater significance. We have a meeting with the Commissioner of Police in, he looked at his watch, ten minutes. Reeford's face became even more grave as he went on. Just under an hour ago, the most alarming news of all came through. At around six o'clock this morning, virtually the entire population of Bournemouth left their homes and walked into the sea in a mass suicide attempt. 
silence filled the room. Men, women and children all drowned. The sores around Bournemouth are littered with corpses. Now Barrow spoke. What about the fog, sir? Has it been sighted? I've issued instructions to locate it, but naturally the local towns have enough on their minds without worrying about the fog. But one thing I did learn, Bournemouth was covered in a thick blanket of fog yesterday. Twenty minutes later, Homan found himself in a large oak-panelled room in Whitehall, surrounded by ministers and their chiefs of staff, having questions fired at him. The Parliamentary Under-Secretary of State for the Army angrily rejected his insinuations that the military in Salisbury might have some answers as to the cause of the fog. The Home Secretary said sharply, Gentlemen, we will not have arguments at this stage. James, I want a full report of all recent experiments carried out at Salisbury, particularly the Broadmire experiment. Homan caught the troubled look that passed between the two men. Then the Home Secretary turned to the Minister of State for Defence. We'll need troops to clear Bournemouth and to control any panic that is bound to break out in the surrounding area. I want to know in which direction the fog is heading and I want its path cleared of people. For the next 40 minutes, plans of action were laid down for the evacuation of people in the path of the threat and ways of dispersing the fog were discussed. Then the commissioner was handed a slip of paper and interrupted the proceeding. They've located the fog, he announced somberly. It's moving back north, towards Winchester. Chapter 12. Herman was driven to the Middlesex Hospital to pick up Casey, with Detective Inspector Barrow acting as escort. The Home Secretary had made him a valuable man. He was the one person they had so far who had recovered from the effects of the mysterious fog. He would have to be examined and his brain patterns studied to find out how he had recovered and if he were now immune. Casey was necessary too, as the nearest person suffering from the effects. Corpses would be flown up from Bournemouth by helicopter for autopsies to be performed on them in an attempt to discover exactly what damage had been done to their brain. Others, still living but insane, would be selected and flown up for further tests. But at that precise moment, John Homan and Casey Simmons were the two most important people in England. From the hospital, they were taken with Barrow to the Ministry of Health building at the Elephant and Castle. Homan sat in the ambulance, looking down at Casey, who was under sedation, holding her hand in both of his. He looked at his watch, 9.45. People were scurrying off to work, their days just beginning, just hearing of the devastating news from the seaside resort. Whom would you blame? The government? The Russians? The Chinese? What excuse would the government give? pollution? But the public weren't that stupid anymore. They would suspect a chemical, a poisonous gas, mistakenly unleashed by some scientific laboratory. As Homan thought about it, the ambulance stopped and the doors opened. Casey was taken through a more private entrance to the rear of the building, and Homan and Barrow went down in a lift. A plump, middle-aged woman wearing a white coat greeted them when the door opened. You must be Mr. Homan, she said, smiling. I've been reading your file. Your photograph doesn't do you justice. I'm Janet Halstead, the principal medical officer. She led Homan and Barrow into an office and perched on the edge of the desk. Now, first, please tell me all that's happened to you and leave out nothing. The smallest thing could be of the greatest importance. After that, we've an extremely busy day ahead of us here. The best medical brains are either already here or on their way. I can promise you we've wasted no time in the past couple of hours. And let me tell you briefly who will examine you. Most of them are from these units. Cellular disorders, infectious and immune diseases, psychiatry and nervous disorders, biochemical parasitology, neurobiological studies, brain metabolism, cell mutation, molecular genetics, immunochemistry and cellular immunology, molecular pharmacology, neurological prostheses, and neuropsychiatry. She smiled at Homan. Two others. Environmental radiation, and I believe the Ministry of Defense is sending us some of their chemical defense and microbiological researchers. Homan was silent for a moment, a troubled look on his face, and then he spoke. 
two units stuck in my mind. One I think you've tried to hide among the others. The obvious one was environmental radiation. The other was cell mutation. She looked at him keenly. Yes, I did bury it among the others. I didn't want to alarm you. As I said, many of these divisions of investigation will be a waste of time. I think cell mutation will be one of these, but we have to be sure. As for environmental radiation, well, that's an obvious one, isn't it? But what exactly can you find out from me? First of all, information. By examining you, we can find to what extent your brain was damaged, if it was your brain. And what about Casey? Oh, Miss Simmons? We'll try to cure her. Janet Halstead reached behind her and switched on the tape recorder. Now, she said, take your time and tell us everything you know about this mysterious fog, starting at the beginning. The rest of the day was just a blur to Homan. He was probed, tested, examined, interrogated, and by late afternoon he was allowed to fall into an exhausted sleep. He awoke after several hours to find Barrow sitting in a chair by his bedside. You were out for the count, said Barrow. Well, tell me what's been happening while I've been asleep, said Homan. Quite a lot. A couple of hours ago, the doctors had a go at those blokes from Porton Down, the microbiological research scientists. They were refusing to answer any more questions until they'd seen their minister. It all seems to point in the same direction, doesn't it? Homan commented. How's Casey, he went on. I don't know, but I'll get the medical officer. She'll tell you. He gave instructions to a uniformed policeman outside the room to find Janet Halstead. What's happened with the fog? asked Homan as they waited. They found it, you knew that, and it's drifting along slowly about a mile wide and a mile high. It's growing, it's becoming thicker. And how has the public reacted? As you would expect, panic, fear, accusations. And what reason has been given? Uh, officially, uh, a poisonous gas drifted in from the sea and caused the disaster in Bournemouth. My God, are people falling for it? What about the eruption? No connection, officially. School? What about the school? It's been called an accidental fire. In two major disasters concerning the lives of thousands, the school incident has been easily swallowed up. There was silence for several moments. Does the public know about the fog? Uh, yes, they had to be informed anyway to get them to move out its path. The door opened and Janet Halstead entered. Hello, how are you feeling? Her smile was a little more strained than it had been that morning. Oh, I'm fine. Tell me about Casey. Her condition is deteriorating, but there is a chance. He looked up at her, hopefully. We are pretty sure we know what is happening. We all feel, that is, the members of the Medical Research Council, that the chemical and microbiological researchers from the Ministry of Defence are holding out on us. In their tests, they seem to know exactly what it was they were looking for, as though they were looking for confirmation of an answer that they already had. We let them finish, and then we confronted them. But they clammed up and went off to see their minister. Bastards, they're covering up. Homan leapt from the bed. Barrow, you get me Sir Trevor Chambers at the Department of the Environment. If he doesn't get some answers, I'm going to blow this thing sky high. Okay, okay, but keep calm. Yes, said Janet Halstead. It's no good getting excited. And while Inspector Barrow gets in touch with Sir Trevor, I can put you in the picture as to our findings today. Chapter 13 Two hours later, Homan found himself at the Ministry of Defence, sitting between Janet Halstead and Sir Trevor Chambers, who had made suitable bellowing noises in the right ears. As he waited for the meeting to begin, Homan looked down the length of the long oak table. He recognised some of the faces and had been introduced to others. He tried to remember the names and titles while he waited. The Home Secretary, Charles Lyle Smith, looking calm and unruffled as always. The Minister of State for Defence, Lord Gibbon, and his principal private secretary, 
deep in conversation with a parliamentary under Secretary of State for Defense for the Army, William Douglas Glynn, and his principal private secretary. The big bluff Chief of Defense Staff, Sir Hugh Dowling, talking across the table at the Chief of the General Staff, General Sir Keith Macklin. The Chief Scientific Advisor, Professor Hermann Reicher, silently studying a document in front of him, underlining certain points with a pencil. The Home Secretary rapped on the table. Gentlemen, he began, and lady, he smiled briefly at Janet Halstead. You all know the facts. We are here to discuss a plan of action. The Prime Minister's instructions are that there is to be no cover-up between ourselves. We are here to find solutions so that we can combine our various skills to combat this growing, and I mean that literally, threat. He looked across the table, allowing his words to take their effect. Then he turned to the Minister of State for Defence, seated on his left, and said, Richard, will you start? Lord Gibbon leaned forward. Uh, yes. Um, well, 15 years ago, our microbiological research establishment at Porton Down had a brilliant scientist named Broadmire. His speciality was bacteriological warfare. He took mycoplasma and mutated it, producing an organism that could affect the brains of men or animals. Lord Gibbon turned to the Chief Scientific Advisor. Would, would you go on, Professor Riker? Riker looked around at the assembly. Lord Meyer was a little irresponsible. He mutated the mycoplasma so that if it entered the bloodstream, it would attack the healthy existing cells and travel as a parasite to the brain. The microorganisms caused inflammation of the brain and led to a build-up of new parasitical cells. The stronger the parasites become, the more easily the healthy cells are devoured. Hence, the complete mental breakdown of whoever contracts the disease. Eventually, the victim will become a vegetable, capable of no action at all. But what about me? Herman exclaimed. Why didn't I become a vegetable? The principal medical officer spoke up. Mr. Homan was given a blood transfusion because of an injury he sustained during his attack. I assume this helped to clear the bloodstream of the foreign cells. Precisely, Mrs. Halstead, the professor nodded. Luckily for Mr. Holman, he received a transfusion before the parasitical cells had a chance to multiply. But he was also lucky in another respect. Like most organisms used in germ warfare, the broad Meyer mutation was self-reproducing. All it needed was carbon dioxide to grow and grow. Mr. Holman was exposed to it when it had just been released in its pure form, therefore it was comparatively weak. The fog is a byproduct of the process it goes through as it draws the carbon dioxide from the air. This in itself is strange, for normally an organism that lives on carbon dioxide will require sunlight to live and multiply. So you see the contradiction. They should need sunlight to exist, and yet they surround themselves with this strange mist. Only Broadmeyer, as the creator of this mutation, knew the answer. And unfortunately, he is dead, killed by the disease that he made. The mutation was contained and was considered too dangerous to use. Perhaps uh, Lieutenant General Macklin would care to tell you what happened to it. He raised his eyebrows towards the vice chief of the general staff. Uh, first, Janet Halstead broke in hastily, may I ask Professor Riker about the cure? The Home Secretary nodded. You confirm that blood transfusion is the answer then, Professor? She asked Riker. Oh, yes, provided it is given in time. If the parasite cells have taken on too strong a hold in the brain, then new blood will be of no use at all. But what if we use radiology to burn out the bad cells. Yes. Yes, it's, it's a possibility. But remember, nothing can ever be done about healthy cells that have been damaged, either by the parasites or the X-ray. They will never grow again. No, but it is a chance worth taking, said Mrs. Halstead. She turned to Homan. 
I'm going to give Miss Simmons a blood transfusion and, if necessary, subject her to radiology. She looked around the table and rose. Excuse me, gentlemen, I have some lives to save. I trust you will keep me informed. Professor Riker suppressed an admiring grin as she marched from the room. The Home Secretary cleared his throat. <coughs> Is this disease infectious? Could Mr. Homan pass it on to others? Well, uh, it does not appear to have happened, does it? Riker answered. Our problem is that we do not know enough about mycoplasma and its normal state, let alone when it has been tampered with. Mycoplasmas are similar to bacteria with one important exception. They lack a cell wall. Riker's next words cut through the incomprehension like a knife. This means they are completely resistant to penicillin and any other substances which act by disrupting the synthesis of bacterial cell walls. Uh, you mean there is no cure? asked the Trevor. Oh, no, 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 we will find one, Riker assured them all. But we need to know exactly how the mycoplasma has been mutated. If you had some of the mutated mycoplasma in its pure state, then it would be an enormous advantage. This is leading to our next point, gentlemen, said the Home Secretary. I'd like to get back to Lieutenant General Macklin. Sir Keith, how did the virus escape? Sir Keith Macklin rose to his feet as though to address the officers on his staff. The Broadmire mycoplasma, he began, was contained in a sealed-off room in small glass steel containers. Broadmire noticed a dislodged cap, replaced it, and left the sealed room. It took a while for him to become insane. When he did, he went under very fast. He destroyed his work and killed a fellow scientist and then killed himself. We decided the mutation was too dangerous ever to be used. We couldn't destroy it. We didn't know what it was exactly. And we couldn't dump it in the sea. We considered that was too risky. So we buried it two miles below ground in glass steel vials inside a strong lead container. Sir Keith paused and went on. Records were made concerning the mycoplasma's potential and its location and filed away 15 years ago, as I said. Then a few weeks ago, we were experimenting with a powerful new explosive and it caused a running fissure below the earth. It was this that caused the eruption and released the mycoplasma. Do you mean to tell me you have a bomb that can cause that sort of damage two miles down? asked Sir Trevor incredulously. Yes, answered Sir Keith. The fissure that caused most damage was several miles deep. We assume it was a mutation already polluted and creating its own gas that was seen emerging from the fissure. The Home Secretary spoke before anyone else had a chance to. Thank you, Sir Keith. The Vice Chief of the General Staff sat down and the Home Secretary continued. Gentlemen, we know most of the facts now, and let me stress that human error of this magnitude will not be tolerated. I can assure you, he looked at Sir Trevor, it will be looked into thoroughly after we have defeated the present threat. Now, let us get on with it. We have lost the battle to prevent the fog entering Winchester. Fortunately, all the residents have been evacuated in time. Perhaps you will tell us what's been happening, William. The Home Secretary turned to the Under Secretary of State for Defence for the Army, William Douglas Glynn. We're looking at various possibilities, said Douglas Glynn. When we haven't been able to get rid of the fog, because it goes on manufacturing itself. We've tried all the ways known to us, so if we cannot disperse the fog, our only hope is to find the antidote to the disease, fast. And to make that serum, we need some of the mutated mycoplasma itself, as Professor Riker says, in its purest form. Sir Trevor Chambers looked across at the scientist. Couldn't someone wearing protective clothing get close enough to get a sample? It's not a matter of getting close enough, said Riker. It means going to the very center or nucleus of the mycoplasma itself. Sir Trevor broke in huffily. All right, so the neat stuff is in the center. That still doesn't prevent someone with suitable protection going in to get it. There is no practical protection from it, said Riker. Lead-lined suits, said Herman. 
The wearer would have to travel half a mile to reach the fog center in virtual darkness and still have no guarantee you'd be safe from a mutated mycoplasma at its strongest. The Home Secretary sat back in his chair. What we need is someone who is immune to the disease to go in and bring back a sample. You, Mr. Herman, it would seem, are the only possibility. Chapter 14 No one could force Herman to enter the fog again, but what else could he do? If they couldn't destroy the fog, then millions could die from it. The only answer was the serum, and he was the only suitable person available. Now, as he walked through the yellow mist, he thought of Casey. The transfusion on Casey had been successful. This morning, it would be the turn of radiation to burn out the badness, and he prayed that it would work. He dreaded the moment he would have to tell her that Simmons was dead. Herman would never tell Casey she had killed her own father. It might destroy her. The fog was becoming thicker, more yellow. He began to think about the street plan of Winchester. Now let's see, he thought. This must be the shopping arcade. Now if I turn right, it could lead me to the cathedral. They told him the source of energy seemed to be coming from somewhere near the old cathedral. The trolley that trailed along behind him like a faithful dog contained a lead-lined box that operated on the same principle as a vacuum cleaner. Attached to its side were several lengths of metal tubing that when assembled and joined to a tough flexible hose from the container could be probed into the nucleus of the mutated mycoplasma and a sample drawn back by the holder. It was a hastily conceived plan, but the only one available to them in so short a time. Summoning up his courage, Homan turned into the street leading to the cathedral, and as he approached the cathedral's entrance, he noticed a faint half-glow. He stopped dead. Was it possible? Was the nucleus, the heart of the disease, housed within Winchester Cathedral? Another, more disturbing thought jarred Homan's mind. What if it hadn't drifted in by accident? Could it possibly be self-motivated? The thought persisted as he walked on into the great church. Homan looked towards the source of the glow. It was at its strongest at the center of the cathedral's vast interior near the altar. Homan knelt down by the machine at his side. He remembered his oxygen mask and drew in several deep breaths. His head immediately became clearer. He still wasn't sure if he had the courage to approach the glowing mass, the mass that looked pure but was in fact made from the deadly growing mutation, so he closed his mind to it. He concentrated on putting the rods together. Suddenly, he heard a footstep behind, and someone put his arms around Homan's neck, squeezing his throat, trying to choke him to death. Homan felt as though his head was about to explode. His consciousness slipped away from him, and a deep-throated chuckle was the last sound he heard before he blacked out. Later, the fog began to clear from the town. Helicopters hovering around the fringes of the thick blanket swooped down to search for Homan and found the lunatic trying to bury him alive. They landed to find Homan at the bottom of the open grave where he'd been roughly dumped. He opened his eyes to see a face above him. It grinned, and its voice said, This is no time to lie down on the job, Mr. Homan. A hand was extended to help him climb from his gruesome resting place. Chapter 15 Homan was filled with apprehension as he walked towards observation room 3, in which Casey was now resting. He had been told the radiology treatment had gone well, and now they were waiting for Casey to come out of a deep slumber before they could tell if it had been successful. Homan needed sleep, too. His experience that morning had left him drained. Riker had naturally been disappointed when he had returned without a sample of the mutated mycoplasma, but did not persist in urging Homan to try again. The unpredicted change of weather was moving the fog too rapidly anyway for him to be able to locate its center. Towns that lay directly in its path were being evacuated, but fortunately the direction in which it was moving was not too densely populated. 
They prayed that the wind would not change its easterly direction and carry the fog towards Basingstoke, Farnham, Aldershot, London. The proposal to build huge fires in London to disperse the fog if it entered the city was considered, thus it was to be a last resort. The public had been told an antidote was being prepared and large quantities would soon be available. They had been told the disease itself was weakening and would probably soon die. They had been lied to because the government thought it best. Large-scale panic would only increase the danger to lives. Homan had discussed with Riker the fact that the mutated mycoplasma had been trapped inside the cathedral. Could it have... Homan had hesitated to say it. Could it have... intelligence? After all, it, it was a parasite that fed on the brain. Professor Riker had laughed, but without humor. <laughs> Every living thing has some intelligence. It's a matter of degree. But to suggest this organism has a mind of its own? No, no, Mr. Holman. Don't let your harrowing experience this morning send you into the realms of fantasy. It is a mindless, organic thing, incapable of action by thought. Barrow had accompanied Holman to the research center after Holman had given his report to the Home Secretary in person, promising he would attempt to procure some of the mycoplasma as soon as conditions were favorable. When that moment arrived, he would be flown to the spot immediately. The rising trepidation Homan felt reached its peak when he sat down in the chair beside Casey's bed. He sat watching Casey's face for several minutes, then he touched her lips with his hand and spoke her name. For an instant, her eyelids flickered, and then they opened. He froze, and for that tiny second, nothing existed. Then the eyes became a person's, because emotion was filtering through them, and they smiled, and her lips smiled with them. Why do you call me Casey, John? She asked, and went back to sleep. The principal medical officer, Janet Halstead, was delighted when Homan told her of Casey's words. She found him in a quiet room and left him resting while she went back to study Casey's chart. Three hours later, Barrow woke him. She's awake, Homan, and she's fine, he told him. Any new developments with the fog? Homan asked as he slipped on his jacket. Plenty, but I'll tell you later. Casey's face lit up as Homan walked through the door, and in a second they were in each other's arms. You're all right, Homan laughed, breaking away from the tight embrace at last. Do... He hesitated. Do you... remember... Anything? I remember trying to kill you, she said, looking away. He drew her towards him and said nothing. My father's dead, isn't he? Homan was stunned. She remembered that. Finally, he said, Yes, Casey, he's dead. She cried out then. I loved him. I loved him so much. How can I ever live with what I've done? It wasn't your fault, Casey. You weren't responsible. And you, John, I tried to kill you too. Can you forgive me? I told you, darling, you weren't responsible. Am I really all right now? Yes, of course you are. He talked to her quietly for a long time, the intensity of his words breaking through her barrier of regret. What's going to happen now? She finally asked. They want me to go back into the fog for the mycoplasma. Briefly, he told her of the disasters, of his immunity, and the fact that she would now be immune. He told her of the disease, of its origin, of the blind foolishness that had freed it. They were interrupted by Janet Halstead. We still have a few more tests to make on Miss Simmons, and then I think she should get some rest. Homan kissed Casey and promised to return as soon as he was allowed. Barrow was waiting for him in the corridor. They want you to go in again, he told Homan. <sighs> All right. Since I have no choice, I'll choose to try again. A helicopter flew them to a point east of Hazelmere. They were met by Professor Riker, who said... We are going to spray the fog with calcium chloride all night to dry it up. And by early morning, it should have depleted enough for us to see the actual mycoplasma. 
In the meantime, Mr. Holman, there is nothing for you to do. I suggest you try to sleep, and we'll call you when the time is right. But morning brought a surprise. Barrow woke Holman and said, The fog's gone. It's disappeared. Chapter 16 Holman opened his eyes and then turned towards the figure lying in his bed next to him. How different she looked from the last time she'd been in his flat. Would he ever forget the violence of her attack on him? Janet Halstead had assured him Casey was completely cured, as was he, and had allowed him to bring her home. But it was difficult to rid himself of all his fears. Only time would do that. Holman was on call at any time, Although they had found no trace of the fog for two days now, the trail of havoc was appalling, for not everybody had been cleared from its path in time. For many, the effect was immediate, causing instant madness. Many people were killed. Many killed themselves. On the first day of quiet, when the fog had inexplicably disappeared, the public had started to demand answers. What was the fog? Where had it come from? Had it really gone? And if so, could it possibly return? Were there still lunatics at large? And what were the first symptoms? Today was the day of answers and reassurances. Homan's hand found the soft curve of Casey's waist, and he dreaded the telephone call that might take him away from her. The thought of going back into the fog was repugnant to him, and he prayed it had been finally vanquished. She stirred and snuggled towards him. After some time, he rolled onto his back. She turned sideways to gaze at his relaxed face. Why do you call me Casey? she asked suddenly. He began to chuckle. <laughs> When I was a kid, I I used to have a dog. A dog? And I used to call it Casey. Casey, you? You had the same sad little eyes, and they made me fall in love with you. And that's why I called you Casey. She fell against him, half laughing. Imagine my delight when I found you were house trained, too. They were silent for a moment. Then she asked, Is it over now? The fog? The nightmare? I just hope so. If it isn't, well, I just don't know what else they can do about it. They'd been lucky, both of them. But the price they had to pay in memories was harsh. He looked down at her, and her eyes met his. She, too, had been lost in her own thoughts. She smiled. I'm okay, she said. I'll get some coffee. He lay back and watched her naked figure slip into his discarded shirt. She walked around the bed and began to draw the curtains, but she stopped midway. John, he heard her say, God, he gasped, for there was just a grey blankness, a heavy, still blankness, tinged with yellow. After two days of searching, just when the army had begun to relax, the fog had appeared again, as though it had been lying in wait. It swept over the countryside, and it grew larger. It passed through the smaller towns, then through industrial estates, which belched out their filthy fumes even during the night, and it welcomed the polluted air, drawing it into its poisonous womb, growing with it. It drifted inwards towards the city. It sent some of the army mad. The rest sped ahead of the fog, loudspeakers blaring out their ill-timed warning but by the time the message registered, it was already too late. The growing fog 
had arrived. Janet Halstead listened in silence, her expression never changing. When she finally put down the telephone, she stared at it for a few seconds longer. Then she began to snap instructions for the immediate evacuation of the research center. All equipment, notes, anything useful that could be dismantled were to be moved to another location, a secret location. Transport was already on its way to take them there. Sam Reynolds, a middle-aged security guard, was checking out his favorite room at the very top of the giant oil company building that towered over the Black River Thames. It contained the largest boardroom table he'd ever seen. Sixty people could be comfortably seated round it. He stepped into the room and strolled towards the huge windows that looked south across London. Tonight, there was an orange glow in the sky, and he drew in his breath as he realized the cause of it. He saw a line of fires stretching across South London, huge fires at irregular intervals, their flames red and frightening. Then the flames seemed to lose their brightness as though they were being covered one by one by a semi-transparent blanket, leaving only a red glow shining dully through. The approaching fog gradually swallowed the town piece by piece until it reached the river just below him. And then even the river was gone, and the fog was brushing against the large plate glass window in front of him. McClellan, Homan's colleague at the Ministry of the Environment, stared from his bedroom window out at the fog. His eyes were heavy from unshed tears. He knew it was the fog. Its yellowish tinge told him that. He was much more aware of the danger than most of the general public, for he had been closer to the strange occurrences through Homan and the dead spires, and many people still did not understand that it was not the fog that killed, but the madness it caused that drove people to their deaths. He turned to look at his wife, asleep and vulnerable. As he thought of his children in the adjoining bedrooms, the tears of bitterness and frustration broke. There must be a way to protect them. Then he had the answer. It wasn't ideal, but it could give them a little time. He went into his daughter's bedroom and took the small toy blackboard from its easel together with some chalk and then went downstairs. He chalked a message in large capitals on the board. Opening the front door, he placed the message on the doorstep, praying that it would serve its purpose. Then he went back upstairs and found his wife's sleeping pills. He filled a glass full of water and returned to his daughter's bedroom. He forced her to take five of the pills. Then he repeated the same operation on the boys next door. Then he woke his wife. Joan at first refused to take the pills, but after much persuasion and then pleading, she agreed. For himself, he took eight. He climbed back into the warm bed and drew his weeping wife to him. They lay there, waiting for sleep. 